Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. It is the truth and we receive it written in our heart and mind. Thank you for the revelation that you're bringing forth. We will be hearers and doers of it and see the fruit of it in Jesus' name. Amen. We've been bringing you several messages on end time events. We've talked about God's set times that reveal the exact timing of end time events. We brought a message on speaking to everybody. Do you know what time it is on God's earth? We must understand that. We talked about the revelation of the seventh month. We talked about knowing what happens in the last days of the church age, important, as we are in those last days. This last weekend, we talked about Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy, which is essential to understand so you're not deceived by all the false teaching about the length of the tribulation. We saw that it's three and a half years. The 69 and a half weeks have elapsed, there's only a half week left, which is the tribulation period, which is also the time of God's dealing with the Jews. And now, of course, they're going to receive the gospel, praise God, and come to the place of being saved. Then we talked about Jesus is coming suddenly to his temple, his church. He's going to come suddenly. And he's going to find out who's walking with him and who is not. Because remember, judgment comes to the, fir to the church first before it comes to the world. Well, tonight we're going to talk about, in light of the fact that he's going to come suddenly to the temple, then you must become prepared and ready unto the coming of the Lord. That is our subject tonight. Every single born-again believer must become prepared and ready all the days of your life unto the coming of the Lord. We begin in Revelation chapter 19. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready. When it says to let us be glad here, this is a subjunctive mood verb, present tense, meaning that we're to continually be being glad, having met conditions. And rejoice, rejoice continually also, if we have met the conditions, subjunctive mood, and give honor unto him. And the reason why we're going to give honor to him, again, this is because we would have met the conditions, showing the fact that we have done what's necessary, as this is looking at it from that standpoint. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, or has come, and his wife has made herself ready. She made herself ready. Well, this means the marriage has occurred, and this is now the marriage supper up there in, in heaven. We see in verse 8, to her, talking about the wife who had made herself ready, was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen. When it talks about arrayed, this means really to be clothed with something. And again, it's because she met the conditions that she might be arrayed or clothed in fine linen. She met the conditions, subjunctive mood. And she did it for herself because it's a middle voice in the Greek, meaning because she met the conditions for herself of being clothed with fine linen, which is righteousness. Well, that's why she was able to come to, and be a part of the marriage. Clean and white, for the fine lin linen is it says here, the righteousness of the saints. But that's not really a good translation. The reason is because this is the word for righteousness, and it is plural. It's not talking about a state of being, which would be a singular. It's talking about righteous acts, plural. The righteous acts is what this means of the saints. Well, the righteous acts produces the fruit of righteousness, bringing the people to be righteous before the Lord. It's only the righteous that are going to pass the test and are going to be with the Lord. <clears throat> They're the ones that are the real disciples. So this tells us if you and I are going to become prepared and ready under the coming of the Lord, well, we've got to meet these conditions. We've got to get clean, get purified, be cleansed as we see, become white as snow, come to the place of being a doer of the word of righteousness, so we will be righteous saints before him, holy ones before the Lord. We come over to Exodus chapter 15. 
Exodus chapter 15, verse 2. The Lord is my strength and song. He's become my salvation. He's my God. And I will prepare him an habitation, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. Notice, he speaks of preparing him a habitation. That's what you and I are to do. Remember, we talked about that we are to be, build up that holy temple and come to the place of being a habitation of God. God wants to come and inhabit you. He comes to want to not only to dwell in you, but also to walk in you and to manifest himself in you. You are to be a habitation of the Lord, so you need to prepare the Him to be a habitation within you as you walk in the ways of the Lord. In Exodus chapter 19, we talked about this, verse 1 in the third month, speaking of Siwan, which is the beginning of the church age, time of Pentecost. We come down to verse 10. The Lord said to Moses, Go into the people, sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes. Today and tomorrow, that's two days. The two days are the two days of the church age, the 2,000 years. Began 30 A.D., finishes 2030 A.D. We're less than 10 years away. And let them wash their clothes. This is the work of a fuller, as we talked about. Washing as clean, white as snow, every speck of anything unclean being eliminated from your life. That is what he wants. That's what's to happen during the church age. The body of Christ who gets born again is to be sanctified, to be set apart, holy, consecrated, dedicated to him, and become washed clean, holy before the Lord. We come to verse 11. And be ready, we've got to be ready against the third day. Because what's going to happen? That's the third day when the Lord's going to come down the sight of all the people. And he is going to come back. And we see the fact that we've got to be ready for the third day because that's the end of the church age. That's when Jesus again will begin to bring forth the taking again of the earth and his rule and reign for a thousand years. It'll begin from heaven as we have talked about. And he will first of all have his angels set forth, Michael and his angels, fighting against the devil and his angels, and they'll be cast out of the heavenlies, and they'll be cast down to the earth, and the devil will know he has a short time. He has the short time of the rule that he is going to have through the Antichrist, which will be 1260 days, 42 months, or times time, and half a time, three and a half years. Well, you gotta be ready. You gotta be prepared and get ready. So important, you must Get yourself sanctified, dedicated. You can't do it yourself, but you have a part to play. How? By hearing and doing the Word of God in all areas so that God can do this great and mighty work. As you are working out your own salvation with fear and trembling, always obeying, then He will be able to work in you to will and do of His good pleasure and accomplish this great work. We see in Exodus 23, we must become ready and prepared. Exodus 23, verse 20. Behold, I send, or this is a participle active, I am sending an angel before thee to keep thee or to guard thee in the way and to bring thee into the place that I have prepared. God has prepared a place for you and I to come to. Well, the angels will minister for us they minister for us, the heirs of salvation. The angels hearken to the voice of the word and do his commandments. So how are they going to accomplish it? It's going to be through the word of God. They will guard you, and they will work to bring you to the place that God has prepared. Same time, you've got to be obedient to the word, of course, because the angels would bring forth the word. Beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke him not. He'll not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. Oh, you're going to have to walk in the ways of righteousness, be obedient to his word. You can't be walking in the ways of sin or transgressing God's word. God expects you to put the word of God first place and do what he commands. If thou will indeed obey his voice, obey in the word of God, and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy unto thine enemies and an adversary unto thine adversary. We need to obey the word of God. And this is going to be a step-by-step -step process. 
There's no shortcuts. It's hearing and doing the word, walking in his ways, having a track record of following after him and seeing God accomplish the work that he wants. He will bring you to that place that he's prepared for every one of us. And that is the place of being a part of the perfected, glorious, holy church, mighty, that is going to be seeing the glory of God manifest greatly on the end time church before the end comes. We come to numbers, the numbers, <coughs> chapter 32. Numbers chapter 32, we first of all begin in verse 6. Moses said unto the children of Gad and the children of Reuben, Shall your brethren go to war, and shall you sit here? Well, some were going to war, and the others were just sitting there. They weren't engaging in what they were supposed to be doing. It goes on in verse 7, he says, Wherefore discourage ye the heart of the children of Israel from going over into the land which the Lord hath given them? Because they weren't willing to get involved in going to the battle and fighting. Verse 11, he goes on and he says, Surely none of the men that came up out of Egypt from twenty years old and upwards shall see the land which I swear unto Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, because they have not wholly followed me. Only those who wholly follow the Lord will be prepared and ready unto the coming of the Lord. Because those are the ones that are going to walk uprightly before him. Remember, all the rest of them died out in the wilderness. But Caleb and Joshua they're the ones who came through and went into the promised land. God wants you to put the word of God first place and wholly follow him. You can't just half-heartedly follow him. You can't follow him sometimes and then do whatever you want the rest of the time. You are to live unto him and wholly follow the Lord. He goes on and says, Save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, and Joshua, the son of Nun, for they have wholly followed the Lord. What happened to the rest of them? Well, it says the Lord's anger was kindled against Israel and he made them wander in the wilderness 40 years and to all the generation that had done evil in his sight of the Lord was consumed. And they were, they did the wrong thing, of course. Well, we come down here and he says in verse 17, We ourselves will go ready armed before the children of Israel until we brought them into their place and our little ones will, shall dwell on the fenced cities because of the inhabitants of the land. They decided they were going to do what they are supposed to do. We're going to get ready and be armed before the Lord and go forth, as it was in this case, to for the children of Israel and bring them to their place. You are to engage in spiritual warfare. You are to fight the good fight of faith. You are to war a good warfare and conquer and overcome and carry off the victory. You are to be seeing total victory come forth in all areas of your life. And it can happen as you hear and you do what the Word says. Well, these guys were to go over and possess the land. They needed to get with the program, as the rest of them were. Verse 20, Moses said to him, If you will do this thing, if you will go armed before the Lord to war, we'll go all of you armed over Jordan before the Lord until he hath driven out his enemies from before him. The land be subdued before the Lord. Then afterward you shall return and be guiltless before the Lord and before Israel and this land shall be your possession before the Lord. That shows you that God expects everybody to engage in the war. And if they would obey, they would be guiltless. If they wouldn't obey, verse 23 goes on and says, If you will not do so, behold, you've sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. That means those who do not engage in spiritual warfare are in sin said they would sin against the Lord. God expects you to fight the good fight of faith, war good warfare, pray all manner of prayers of authority, conquer and overcome everything that the enemy would bring against you. You've got to get armed. You've got to get prepared and ready for warfare because you have an enemy, the devil who is arrayed against you, who seeks to steal, kill, and destroy, and you must be ready to overcome so you don't give place to him in your life. And you can conquer everything that's come into you from inheritance, your own sins, and victimization by casting out all the evil spirits. We come over to Joshua, chapter 4. Joshua, chapter 4, we come to verse 13. It says, About 40,000 prepared for war passed over before the Lord 
onto battle to the plains of Jericho. That's when they were going to come here and begin to take this land and go on in to possess it. Notice, they had all these ones prepared for war. You need to be prepared for spiritual war. You need to know your weapons. You need to know your authority. You need to understand you have authority over all the power of the enemy. You must understand that when you speak in the name of Jesus, you are releasing the authority and the power of attorney is operating through you speaking as he is operating through you, releasing that authority. And when you speak in line with the word, the power of God in the word is going to go forth. And through authority and power, you can conquer everything in your life and see God bring forth total victory. We must get prepared and be ready to engage in spiritual warfare. First Samuel chapter 7. In verse 3, here's where Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If you do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and astereth from among you, and prepare your hearts unto the Lord, and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. The Philistines are a type of the evil spirits. Here he said that they were to put away all the strange gods, all the idols, all the idols have to be eliminated from your life. And he said that you're preparing your hearts unto the Lord. We've got to get rid of all the idolatry things. What are idols that we would have? Anything that becomes a source other than God. One of the biggest idols is self, serving self instead of living unto him. Other idols are people looking to them as a source. Money, an idol for many. They're serving money. They are seek after that. Possessions. All kinds of things. There could be hobbies. There could be sports. There could be stars. There could be food. There could be pets. There could be all kinds of things. Whatever you make as a source. There's nothing wrong with having uh, things. Of course, he gives us all things richly to enjoy. He wants us to have finances. He wants us to enjoy things that he's given us in life. Don't ever make them a source or an idol of of what meets your needs in your life. God is to be your total source in your life. We must put him first place. So he says, prepare your hearts unto the Lord. Now they had to return to the Lord with all their heart. God wants you to give your heart unto him and prepare your heart unto the Lord that you're going to serve him. You're going to follow him and do all the things that he wants you to do. We see over in First Chronicles, chapter 12 and verse 23 said these are the numbers of the bands that were ready armed to the war and came to David the Hebron to turn the kingdom of Saul to him according to the word of the Lord while well, the kingdom was being taken away from Saul and it was being turned unto David and these guys were ready armed for the war well God wants us to get ready armed because the kingdom cannot be with Saul. What was Saul? Saul was a man after the flesh, while David was a man after the spirit. You can't have a kingdom that's operating in the flesh. You've got to have a kingdom that is operating according to the spirit and going to be obedient and do all the things that God wants. Therefore, we've got to end the rule of the flesh. We've got to get the rule of the spirit in operation as you put the word of God first place and you are going to engage in warfare, which means you got to crucify that flesh daily. And Saul was a man after the flesh. We're going to get rid of that kingdom of Saul, so to speak. We're going to get rid of our flesh runniness. And we're going to make sure we're walking in the Spirit according to the Word of God. We see over in 2 Chronicles, chapter 8, verse 16. Now all the work of Solomon was prepared until the day of the foundation of the house of the Lord until, until it was finished. So the house of the Lord was perfected. Remember Solomon's temple is a type of the church. And so here, this work that was to be done was prepared until the day of the foundation of the house of the Lord. Your work that you are to do is prepared by God to hear and to do His Word continually, that's what lays the foundation in your life as you're building the spiritual house within you. 
and it's to be continued. This work is to be prepared and be continued and accomplished until it's finished. And when it gets finished, the house of the Lord will be perfected, as it says. That's where he's going to bring the body of Christ, the remnant, the ones who obey him and follow him. We are going to become the, see the completion of this work of the building of the spiritual house of God and go on unto perfection. We see in 2 Chronicles chapter 12, we come down to verse 14. This is speaking about Rehoboam. And notice what it says about him. And he did evil. Why? Because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. If you don't prepare your heart to seek the Lord, you will do evil. Because if you're not seeking the Lord, you're not going to seek after the things that he wants. Get in the word of God and hear from him and be in the presence of God and praying. Instead, you'll end up be walking in the ways of the flesh, doing whatever you want to do, walking in the ways of the world or sinful ways, and you'll end up doing evil. If you don't prepare your heart to seek the Lord and put him first place in your life, you will do evil. And you'll walk in the ways of sin, and you will not be ready and prepared unto the coming of the Lord. God wants you to get your heart prepared. You're going to seek him. So then you will not do evil in your life. We come to 2 Chronicles chapter 17. We look at verse 18. It says, The next hymn was Jehazabad, and with him a hundred and fourscore thousand, ready, prepared for war. Hey, that's a tremendous amount. That's 180,000 were prepared for war. God wants, just think we had 180,000 Christians in this nation prepared for spiritual war that would engage in it and would warfare intercession and be binding, loosing, casting down, throwing down these spirits from the heavenlies and engaging in spiritual warfare to conquer the works of the enemy. That's what we need. We need a body of Christ to get prepared for war. These waited on the king, besides those whom the king put in the fenced cities through all Judah. Here it speaks of them waiting on the king. And this is those who are going to wait on him, meaning they're ministering to him, they're serving him. That's what God wants. He wants you to be focused on him, ministering to him. It means you're going to deny yourself. And you're going to take up your cross daily, crucify on the flesh, and you're going to follow him and live unto him. And you're going to wait upon the Lord. We see over in 2 Chronicles chapter 19, verse 3, talking about Jehoshaphat. Nevertheless, there are good things found in thee, and that thou hast taken away the groves out of the land, and hast prepared thine heart to seek God. Here we see this speaking about preparing the heart to seek God. God expects you to prepare your heart. That means every day you get up and you're going to do things that God wants you to do. You're going to seek God. You're not going to do what you want to do. Here, they took away the groves, which are evil things that were going on where they were involved in idolatrous worship. And they prepared their heart to seek God. Well, when you do that, then God's going to be there to deliver you. And he ended up getting delivered when the attacks of the enemy came against him. We go to 2 Chronicles 20. Verse 33, Howbeit the high places were not taken away, for as yet the people had not prepared their hearts under the, under the God of their fathers. They were supposed to eliminate all the evil, including the high places where idolatrous things were going on. Notice, they didn't get them taken away. Why? Because the people had not prepared their hearts unto God. If they had prepared their hearts unto God, they would have confessed sin, repented, turned away from everything, and they would have overcome all these things and not be yielding to them any longer than anything that was sinful or evil. And they would have seen these high places be destroyed instead of doing what they wanted to do. They obviously weren't walking right because they did not prepare their heart unto the Lord. Second Chronicles chapter 27. We come to verse 2. This is talking here about Jotham. And it says, And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Isaiah did. Howbeit he entered not into the temple of the Lord, and the people did yet corruptly. He did a lot of things that were right, 
But notice, he didn't enter into the temple of the Lord. Well, kings were supposed to enter into the temple. And this is the temple. This is this word we have seen before, hey, Cal, in, the, in other messages, which is the place of where kings were to reside in the presence of God. You are a king. You're to enter into the presence of God by praising, worshiping him in the word, seeking him, getting in the presence of God. He didn't enter into it. He did a lot of things that were right, but nonetheless, he did not enter into it. That was a mistake. In fact, we see over in 2 Kings, speaking about him, chapter 15, in the account over here, verse 35, this again is speaking about him. He did that was right in the sight of the Lord. Verse 34, but howbeit the high places were not removed, the people sacrificed and burnt incense still in the high places. Here, he wasn't, again, they were doing the wrong thing. The high places were not removed. We've got to get rid of everything that is evil out of our life. They were still sacrificing, burning incense to idols. They were still and had not turned away from things. At the same time, as he was doing things that were right, in the measure, as he's doing things that were right, it was having a good effect. We see this in verse 6. Go back in 2 Chronicles 27, verse 6. So Jotham became mighty. And why was this? Because he was doing things that God wanted. He was building the, the things, the gate of the house of the Lord, building the cities. He was building the things that God wanted. He fought against the enemies, as it said. He was engaging in things that God wanted him to do. And Jotham became mighty because he prepared his ways before the Lord his God. He didn't get everything done that he was supposed to, but nonetheless, he did prepare his ways to do what was right in his sight. Have you prepared your ways? Have you prepared your ways every day to do the things that God wants you to do? And that will involve engaging in warfare, getting the word in you, becoming strong, becoming mighty. Here, Jotham became mighty. This means he was strengthened. He became spiritually strong. You need spiritual strength to be able to overcome the enemy. And God is your strength, and he comes into you through the word of God that you hear and do and act upon. And so he saw that uh, he became mighty. Why? Because he prepared his ways before the Lord. That's what God wants you to do. We come down to chapter 30, verse 19. It says, those ones that prepared his heart to seek God, the Lord God of his Father, though he be not cleansed according to the purification of the sanctuary. This is talking about when the, there was time of Passover and they were going to have the multitudes eat the Passover. Some of them had cleansed themselves. Some of them had not cleansed themselves. Well, this, these group, this group had not cleansed themselves. Yet, because of the fact that they'd prepared their heart to seek God, even though they hadn't got all this cleansing done, well, even though they weren't cleansed according to the purification of the sanctuary, what was expected, nonetheless, it says that the good Lord pardoned everyone, of course, with the expectation that they would seek the Lord and cleanse themselves. You may not have finished the cleansing work, but if you're on the road to cleansing and you have prepared your heart to seek God and to do the things He wants, then you're going to be accepted with the Lord as you are following His ways. He wants you to conquer everything. Don't draw back. Don't get off track. Be working out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Be getting cleansed of all the filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Driving out everything. Dealing with all areas of sin. Everything that's not of the Lord. It'll happen if you prepare your heart to seek the Lord. Well, that's going to be a little by little process, remember, of seeing change and seeing you get delivered and set free. But you've got to have your heart set that you're on course. Make sure that your heart is seeking the Lord and you're doing the things that God wants you to do. That is important. We come over to Ezra. In Ezra chapter 7, we see again about this preparing of the heart. It's so emphasized in the Word of God. Verse 10, For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, and to do it, and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. He's seeking the law. 
So he gets knowledge, gets the word. And he's not only hearing it and learning, but he's doing it. He's applying it in his life, so it's going to produce fruit. You need to be hearing and doing the word as well. In fact, he got it in him to the place where he could teach others. That's what God wants for you. He wants you to hear the word, he wants you to do the word, and he wants you to get it, get it in you to the point where you can teach it to others because you know the word. It's your lifestyle. That'll come because you're hearing and doing it consistently in your own life, and it's become such a part of you in the way you walk, the way you talk, everything you do, you'll be able to go forth and teach others. He wants you to put the word of God first place in your life. Over in Psalms, chapter 10. Verse 17. See, without it, you're never going to be ready and prepared under the coming of the Lord. That's for sure. Psalms 10, verse 17. Lord, thou hast heard the desire of the humble. Thou wilt prepare their heart. Thou wilt cause thine ear to hear. The desire of the humble. God's looking for you to be humble. You now he exalts the humble. He brings low the prideful. Here it says, thou wilt prepare their heart. Because they're humble. God's not going to be able to do a work in your heart if you've got pride. You've got to get rid of the I, 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 me, 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 selfishness, pride mentality. That's what I want to do, attitude. Instead, humility is total submission and yieldness unto God and letting him accomplish the things that he purposes in your life. Be humble. The, if you have humility, God will be able to do a work in your heart, prepare your heart and cause your ear to hear the things that he wants you to hear so you'll be in a position to hear from him, hear spiritually. In Psalms 23, verse 5, this is the psalm about the Lord is my shepherd. In verse 5, he says, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. God will prepare a table of blessing for you, in the presence of your enemies. They're all around. If you walk in the ways of the Lord, they, God will protect you. The angels have charge of you to keep you in all your ways and protect you from enemies, deliver you. But you gotta be, of course, walking in the ways of the Lord. He's gotta be your shepherd. You gotta be a true sheep. The sheep follow the Lord. They hear his voice. They walk in his ways. They put his word first place. They're right on his heels. They're close to him. They're not like the goats who wander around and do whatever they want. You need to be a real sheep following the shepherd. Then God will prepare a table of blessing for you in your life. We see in Psalms 57, verse 6. You must also understand this. This is talking about the enemy. The enemy. They have prepared a net for my steps. Now the devil is preparing a means for you to, as you walk in whatever way you're walking, he wants you to walk contrary to the word, preparing a net for your steps to bring you down. And notice what he says, my soul's bowed down. They've digged a pit before me in the midst whereof they're fallen themselves. Now, the devil, of course, he is, he sinned and he's fallen into the pit himself. People used of the devil. You don't want to be following what they tell you to do because they've fallen into the pit as well. And they'll try to get you to follow wrong people or get around wrong people. You're not to have fellowship with them. You witness to them, but you don't have fellowship with them. You want to make sure that you only walk in the way of the Lord. The devil will try to prepare a net for your steps to catch you. He wants to bring you down. My soul's bowed down. That's someone who's depressed and down. That's what he wants to do, bring you down in the soulless realm get to you in your mind, in your will, in your emotions, in your attitude. That's why you got to guard yourself. You guard your heart, you guard your mind, you guard yourself. You don't get placed in it. You make sure your steps are the right steps and you're following the way that the Lord has for you. We see over in Psalms 107, these are all important things for you to be able to be prepared and ready under the coming of the Lord. Because remember, the devil does come to seek to steal, kill, and destroy. Verse 36, There he maketh the hungry to dwell, that they may prepare a city for habitation. Well, the city is corporately is the body of Christ. And God wants to come and dwell in us and 
we're to be his habitation. He's coming to dwell in us. So the fields plant vineyards which may yield fruits of increase. Well, when he comes and he, he's your habitation, he comes to dwell in you and you start sowing, what's he going to do? He's going to bring increase. He's going to bring blessing. He's going to bring prosperity to you. He's going to multiply the seed sown in your life. But you've got to do what's right. You've got to prepare yourself as a city, so to speak, for God to inhabit you. So that then when you do sow things and plant things, God will bring increase. He is the source to bring increase of things in your life. Proverbs chapter 16. In Proverbs chapter 16, we see in verse 1, the preparations of the heart in man and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. If you have prepared your heart with a word, then the word is going to be coming up before you, what you're going to be doing and or speaking, the answer of the tongue. That's why you've got to have to be prepared. Prepare your heart. Prepare to be ready to answer the things of the word of God. Don't tell your, give your opinions or what you think. You've got to be ready to speak what the word says. That is what is from the Lord. We see in Proverbs chapter 19, verse 29. Here he says, judgments are prepared for scorners. Ah, the scorners, these are the ones that are also boasters. It's a word that refers to those who are boasters or scorners. Those that are full of pride, those that are boasters, those are the scorners, the critical, the negative ones. Oh, they always want to see other people's faults but they won't even deal with themselves. Judgment is prepared for those types and stripes for the back of fools. You know, we can't be those that are fools. Anger you know, rests in the bosom of those people that are fools. And when you have anger, you deal foolishly. We can't be thinking that we're going to see God's blessing if we're yielding to all these things, anger, resentment, bitterness, hatred, getting upset, fears, anxieties, you know, Rebellion, I want my own way, get upset about things. No. Judgments are going to happen for those people. God does not want you to see these things happen. He wants you to see God's blessings come forth. Proverbs chapter 30. We come down to verse 25. The ants are a people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. Well, they're smart, they're wise. You need to have wisdom. And they're diligent, they're not lazy. They get things done. Are you getting the things done that God wants you to get done? Proverbs chapter 6, talking about the ants. Look what it says in verse 6. Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. You ever see an ant just still? No, he's always on the move. He's always busy doing the things that he needs to do. We can't be lazy. We can't be slothful. You can't be wanting somebody else to do things for you. You need to get up and do the things that God wants you to do. Go to the ant, thou slugger. Consider her ways and be wise. They have no guide, overseer, or ruler. Provides her meat in summer and gathers her food in the harvest. How long will you sleep, O slugger? When wilt thou rise out of thy sleep? We can't be spiritually asleep. We've got to be diligent to do the things. Are you going to become prepared and ready if you are asleep? No. <laughs> you need to be spiritually awake and seeking the things of God and doing the things that He wants you to do at all times in your life. We see over in, in Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 1. Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. When you come, be ready to hear the word of God. You should be hearing the word of God and taking heart to it right now as you're hearing it. Be more ready to hear than to give out the sacrifice of fools. That's people just want to talk about themselves, talk about their, talk about their problems sometimes, just dump on every about, about all poor old me kind of attitudes. <laughs> no. You need to be ready to hear the Word of God and get the Word of God that gives you the answers to the problems so you can make the, the, the action upon the Word to see God accomplish what He purposes. 
He's, his way will deliver you and heal you and set you free and provide for you and, and meet every need in your life. Well, we need to be always ready to hear the word. But what happens if you won't hear the word and you just continue on in your own evil ways? You keep on giving place to sin in your life. Uh, it's going to catch up with you. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 13 says, Therefore, this iniquity shall be to you as a breach ready to fall, swelling out on a high wall, whose breaking cometh suddenly in an instant. And when the iniquity cup is full, the breaking comes at an instant. Swelling out in a high wall, this iniquity be like a breach, and all of a sudden the break comes. And then you see these problems, these destructive things, negative things happen. Well, that's because of all the iniquity buildup. When that cup gets full, you will see judgments come your way. We cannot allow that. That's why we've got to deal with everything in your life. Don't think that the things that you are committing of sins, if you're committing sins or lawlessness or unrighteousness or walking in the flesh, that it isn't adding up in the iniquity cup. It is. You need to make sure that you are turning away from all these things. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. This was John the Baptist talking about. He's making a highway for the Lord. Which means you and I need to prepare our way before the Lord. Prepare the way of the Lord. How are we going to prepare the way of the Lord? We're going to get the word in us. We're going to do the word. We're going to walk in the way of the Lord. We're going to make our path straight. So God can come and manifest himself in your life. He wants to come into you and accomplish a great work, and He will. But you've got to put Him first place in your life. We come to chapter 64, verse 4. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, besides thee, what He hath prepared for them that waiteth for Him. It's interesting. This word, wait here. Is actually in the peel stem, and it really, mean, it really means, it, which is an intensive stem. It means to wait for and long for. There's an intensity. You're, you're waiting for, you're longing for Him. And what will happen? Those are the ones that God will reveal Himself to. You'll hear, you'll perceive things, you'll see things God will bring forth. He, what He's prepared for those who are waiting for Him. Of course, we see this over in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, over in verse 9. But it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Who are the ones that love him? The ones that keep his commandments, that keep the sayings of Jesus. You walk in the New Testament commandments, you keep the word, if you love me, Keep my commandments, he says, John 14, 15. So the ones who are loving him, hearing and doing the word, God has prepared these things for those who love him, and he'll start revealing it to you. He'll bring revelation to you. It says, God's revealed unto us by, un, unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. God will reveal all these things to you. But you're going to have to be a hearer and a doer of the word, it's prepared for those who love him. He's looking for those who will walk in his ways. We also see over in Hosea. In Hosea. Or Hosea. Chapter 6. This is where he's speaking to the Jews. And he says, Come, let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn. Judgments came. And he will heal us. He'll bring restoration. He is smitten. Judgments came again. And he will bind us up again, restore when there's been repentance, if they'll return to the Lord. After two days, that's the two days of the church age, the 2,000 years, will he revive us. In the third day, he will raise us up and we will live in his sight. That's right. When the dealing with the Jews, they are going to be raised up and come to the place of getting right with him. Then shall we know, if we follow on to know the Lord is going forth prepared as the morning, he'll come unto us as the rain, as the latter and the former rain under the earth. Well, those rains come to mature the crops. 
Well, they're going to come to mature the people, mature those ones that have come to the Lord as they follow on, following after the way of the Lord. God is going to do a great work to bring them to maturity and raise them up. Well, that's what he wants to do in your life. That's why you've got to be a hearer and a doer of the word. And God will accomplish this great work. He'll bring you to maturity. You know, it's all going to be because of fruit, more fruit, much fruit in your life, being true disciples of the Lord. We come over to Luke chapter 1, verse 17. Luke 1, 17. It says, He shall go before him in the spirit and the power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. You've got to be prepared for the Lord. Is he going to be in fellowship with, our, with anybody that's walking in sin? No. What kind of church is he coming for? He's coming for a church that's without spot, without wrinkle, holy, without blemish. That's what he's coming for, the ones that have been sanctified. Those ones that have, are now righteous and white and clean. They've cleansed themselves. That's what God wants. He wants you to come to the place of being up one of the people prepared for the Lord because you have seen this work of God be done. You're building your spiritual house. You're overcoming and conquering everything. You are preparing and getting yourself ready unto the coming of the Lord. Now look what it says when we come to Matthew. Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22, he's talking about those ones here who are invited to the marriage. Verse 2, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a certain king which made a marriage for his son. Sent forth the servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding. They wouldn't come. He's calling everybody. Uh, they wouldn't come. Again, he sent forth other servants saying, Tell them that are bidden, or those ones that are called. Behold, I prepared my dinner, my oxen, fatlings are killed, all the things are ready. Come into the marriage. It's all ready and prepared. Well, did they come? No, they didn't respond whatsoever. And of course, who's this talking about? The Jews did not respond to the gospel at all. Verse 8, then he said to his servants, the wedding's ready, but they that were bidden were not worthy. And they didn't respond at all. So what's the answer? Go therefore in the highways, as many as you find, bid to the marriage. God wants us to find everybody out there in the world and call them to come to receive Jesus, be born again, and begin to follow him and walk in his ways so that they are going to be able to come to the marriage. So those servants went out in the highways, gathered all they could found, both bad and good. The wedding was, wedding was furnished with guests. You see, when you first come to him, there's some that are good, some that are bad, but nobody is, you know, is going to be condemned over what the, the things they've done. Remember, he's not imputing our trespasses against us. So we come to him, we get born again, now God wants to do a work in our life. Because when you come to the wedding, you got to have a wedding garment on. Verse 11, when the king came in to see the guests, the ones who were invited, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. Everybody has to put on a wedding garment if you're coming to the wedding. Well, if you're putting on a wedding garment, that means you have cleansed yourself and you have cleaned up. Look what it says when it says had not, put on, had not on. It's the word enduo, which means to clothe oneself. And this is meaning the fact that he didn't clothe himself for himself because it's a middle voice. The middle voice means that the subject is doing the action for himself. So the man had not put on and clothed himself to have this wedding garment. Also, it is a perfect tense. The perfect tense describes action completed in the past with present results at the time of speaking. Meaning, he was to have already done this work in the past, completed it, and have an ongoing continual effect in his life at the time of speaking. So it should have been done. He should have had this clothing on, this wedding garment. He didn't. Verse 12. He said to him, Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? 
He was supposed to have this already. When it talks about him having a wedding garment, that mean, meant he would have this, this work, continuing work in his life. It's a present tense. And the wedding garment, remember, is the one who is clean, the one who is, who is white, the one who is got the clothed, now clothed with righteousness because of the righteous acts. We saw all that in Revelation chapter 19, verse 7 and 8, when we first began. He didn't have a wedding garment on. What happens to him? Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Uh, he's not going to be saved. And he's not going to be in the wedding because he didn't put on the wedding garment. Everybody has to put on the wedding garment. And you've got to be white and clean and righteous. God does the work, but you have to do your part to play because you're going to do it for your own benefit. Look what it says after this. Many are called, but few are chosen. Remember all those ones that were called? Every, all these ones were called, went out on the highways, the byways, they were all called. But only few were chosen. Ah, you've got to be chosen. Why would you be chosen? Because you responded to the call of God in all aspects, including the putting on, the clothing of yourself with a wedding garment, becoming one who is righteous and holy and clean and white, working out your own salvation, becoming one who's prepared and ready to the coming of the Lord, a one who is holy before Him. Many are called, but only few are chosen. That's not the way it's supposed to be. Everybody's supposed to be ready. Look over here in Matthew chapter 25. We see the same principle. Here's about the ten virgins. They had their lamps. They were going to go to meet the bridegroom. Five were wise, five were foolish. Foolish took their lamps. They had no oil in them. That meant they weren't prepared. The wise took the oil in their vessels with their lamps. They were prepared. The bridegroom tarried. They all slumbered and slept. Midnight cry made. The bridegroom comes. Go out to meet him. All the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. Not a good translation. It literally means going out, because it's a present tense verb. It's going out. Why would their lamps be going out? Because they didn't, they weren't prepared, they weren't ready, they had not done what was necessary for them to have what was necessary to have light in them. Well, the other guys had done what was necessary. The wise answered and said, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but rather go to them that sell and buy for yourself. Everybody has to buy for themselves. You have to get what's necessary. And how are you going to do it? Because you're going to get in the Word of God and hear and do the Word of God yourself. They went to buy. The bridegroom came. They that were ready, prepared and ready, went in with him to the marriage. So only the ones that are prepared and ready go into the marriage, and the door was shut. That means the ones that weren't prepared and ready, well, they didn't get into the marriage. The door was shut. Well, they showed up later. After it came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. He answered and said, I say unto you, I know you not, or I have not known you. Huh. He would not knowing you. That tells you something. If you are not prepared and ready, he doesn't know you. Why would you not be prepared and ready? Because you're not preparing your heart. You're not seeking the Lord. You're not in the Word. You're not working out your own salvation. You're not living unto him. You're not humble before him. All these things that we have seen. You're not being a hearer and a doer of the Word. You must be doing something else. These guys, they didn't have what was necessary for them to have the oil for the light. You need to be ready and prepared by hearing and doing the Word consistently and walking in it all the days of your life. Put the Word of God first place. He doesn't know those who, aren't, who, who have not done what's necessary to be prepared and ready. He doesn't know them. He only knows the ones that are prepared and ready because those are the ones that are doing what He says and walking in His ways. And that is what he expects. And of course he says, Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. 
you got to be ready. you got to be prepared. And that means you're going to be spiritually watching because you're in tune. You're following after the way of the Lord. In fact, we come down to verse 34. The king will say to those on the right hand, those are the ones that were doing what he commanded, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Because they were serving the Lord, ministering, they ministered to someone, remember? This is the one who ministered to at least the, one of the least of these. Well, we come down to verse 41, and he says, Eventually say also to them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed and everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Why was that? Because they had not done what he told them to do. Here, he said in verse 45, Then shall he answer him, saying, Verily, verily I, say, verily I say unto you, Insomuch as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. They weren't living unto him whatsoever. What's the result? These go into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Only the righteous are the ones who are prepared and ready unto the coming of the Lord. You must be that way. We see over in Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14, we pick up over in verse 38. Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready. It's always ready and willing to do things according to your spirit. The flesh is weak, strengthless. Well, what dwells in the flesh? Sin. That means if you walk according to the flesh, you're walking in sin. But if you walk according to the Spirit, it's always ready and prepared to do what's right. You won't enter into temptation. How would I walk according to the Spirit? What is, the, what is Spirit? The Word. Jesus said, my words, they are Spirit and they are life. You're going to walk according to the Word of God. That's how you walk in the Spirit, with your Spirit. Well, instead, if you walk in the flesh, you're walking in sin, and you will enter into temptation. God wants you to watch and be praying, be watching and be praying consistently. We also see in Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, we pick up over in verse 42. The Lord said, Who is then is that faithful and wise steward, whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household to give him their portion of meat in due season? Well, who's that one that's going to be wise? Here we see, he said, Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Of a truth I say unto you, he'll make him ruler over all that he hath. If you're a doer of the things that God says, then he'll make you a ruler. But, and if that servant say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and, and he begins to beat the men servants, maidens, eat and drink, and to be drunken, he's not living on the Lord, he's doing evil, sinful things. What's going to happen? The Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looked not for him, at an hour when he's not aware, and will cut him in asunder, and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. He's not going to be saved, because he's not living unto him, and not doing the things that God wants him to do. Verse 47. That servant who knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. He expects you to do what he says. He didn't prepare himself. If you prepare yourself, you're going to do the things <coughs> that God wants you to do. <clears throat> Verse 48, But he that knew not did commit things worthy of uh, uh, stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. Well, God expects us to be prepared. If we get prepared and get the word in us and we do it, then we're not going to be beaten whatsoever. We're going to be doing what he wants and we're going to be entering in to the things that he has for us. And we are going to be, as he says, we're going to be a ruler over all that he has. God wants you to be a hearer and a doer of his word. Put things first place in your life that are in line with the word of God. Get rid of anything. It's a time waster. Get rid of things that are fruitless. Luke 14, verse 17. He sent his servant at supper time to say to them that are bidden, Come, all things are now ready. And what they say? 
Well, they all, with one consent, began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I bought a piece of ground. I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. Another said, I bought five oxen, of a, a yoke of oxen. I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. Another said, I've married a wife, therefore I cannot come. So the servant came, showed his lord these things, and the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly in the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor, the maimed, the halt, and the blind. Because these people all had excuses. If you have excuses, it's not going to hold water with God. There is no excuse. Your life is to be lived unto him. How did you get spiritual life anyway? By receiving Jesus and being born again. That's how you came out of spiritual death into spiritual life. So you're bought with a price, you're a purchased possession, you belong to him, you're not your own. How can you live unto yourself? That's basically a denial of what he has done because he's purchased you. You're not your own. So if you're not your own, you can't live unto yourself if you understand that you're not your own. And if you are not living unto him, then basically you've got all your other excuses for why you're not doing what he wants. There are no excuses. Everybody must put the word of God first place and do the things that he says and follow him. John chapter 7, verse 6. This is the time of tab tabernacles when Jesus said, My time, for his time to fulfill what tabernacles about, which is him coming to begin to rule and reign, which he will in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. It'll happen, but the time is not going to be until after the church age is over and after he then begins to bring forth the judgments upon the earth, deals with the Jews for three and a half years, and then after that, the catching up of the church to meet the Lord in the air at the end of the tribulation, fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets, then we coming back with him with the Day of Atonement, judgment upon the nations, and five days later, that's the time of tabernacles. That's when he'll begin to rule and reign from Jerusalem to be in the king over the earth. It says, my time's not yet come, but your time is always ready. What's it, what would be ready about our time? Always prepared and ready. Our time to see the fulfillment of what tabernacles is also about, which is the completion of the work of God in your life to bring you to perfection in the Lord. So you are going to be a part of the glorious church. Uh, every one of us needs to go in and see God accomplish everything that he purposes to bring us to be holy and righteous before him. We see in John chapter 14, verse 2, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. That's right. It doesn't mean you're going to automatically get there. You've got to make sure you're walking right to get there. If I go and prepare a place for you, which he does, I will come again, ah, second coming, and receive you unto myself, caught up to meet the Lord near, the rapture, that where I am will be with him, wherever he is. It says there, it's not there in the Greek, it literally says, you may be also. Many people thought that this is talking about there in heaven, thinking that this is talking about in heaven. It's not. There, you look at it, it's italicized. There is no Greek word behind that. It's been added by the translator because they thought that's what he was meaning. No, it's wherever he is that we will be with him. And initially, we're going to be caught up to meet him in the air. And then we're going to go back to heaven with him. And then we're going to come back when he's bringing the judgment upon the nations. So this is talking about he's going to receive us unto himself, and wherever he is, we're going to be with him from that point on. Now, another thing that we see that's important is your area of your mind. If you're going to be prepared and ready under the coming of the Lord, you've got to govern your mind. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, look what it says. Casting down imaginations, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You and I are to govern our mind. Anything that's contrary to the word of God, you cast it down. 
Any thought that's contrary to God's ways, you bring captive to the obedience of Christ. And notice he goes on and says, and have it in a readiness, being prepared and ready, this means. You're to be prepared and ready to revenge all disobedient, disobedient thoughts when your obedience is fulfilled. Now, if you don't take your thoughts captive, then you won't have your obedience fulfilled. If you don't cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, you let the devil have place in your mind, then you'll have let disobedience take control over you through those evil thoughts. That's why you're to revenge the disobedient thoughts that are coming from the enemy. And it happens when your obedience is fulfilled of what? Casting down the imaginations and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. But you're to be ready and prepared to do this. That means you've got to govern your mind. If you don't govern your mind with the Word of God and take your thoughts captive, you'll pretty much have a defeated life. Well, the devil will bring all kinds of negative things in your mind, full of worries, cares, anxieties, negative things, negative thoughts, all kinds of stuff. You need to guard yourself. You need, you need to get the Word in you. You need to get your mind renewed so you get the mind of Christ established in you and be a hearer and a doer of the word, and guard your mind. Do not let the enemy get to you. You take every thought captive and cast down anything that's contrary to the word of God. Another thing we need to do, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 15. This is talking about the armor of God, where you put on the armor of God, the word of God in all areas. And what part of it is, Ephesians 6.15, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Or your feet, or you take walk out step by step by step, so this speaks of your walk. It's to be shod or bound on with the preparation, like you're putting on sandals, so to speak, the preparation of the gospel of peace. So, I mean, this preparation is talking about you and I having an inner preparation of the word in us. Wherever we go, we'll be ready to preach the gospel to others, or ready to walk in it, do what the Word says, whatever way, in all of our steps, we're going to follow the way of the Word. But you've got to get internally prepared through the Word in you if you're going to go forth and see all these things be accomplished. Preaching the gospel to others as well as walking out the Word and being ready to overcome anything that would come against you. Another thing that we see it's important, second. Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having the seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. Well, he knows those that aren't his as well. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Those would be the ones that would be his. The word iniquity is the word adakia, which means unrighteousness. So, if you name the name of Christ, you say you're a Christian, you are to depart from unrighteousness. He expects that of you, if you are really one of His. In a great house, there's not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man, therefore, purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Notice. This is someone purging. The word purge means to cleanse out, to cleanse thoroughly. And this is what you're to do. This means this is a, a conditional statement, though, because it's a subjunctive mood. Meaning if a man might purge, cleanse out, cleanse thoroughly himself from these, from what? From the unrighteousness. He's going to be a vessel unto honor. He'll be sanctified. He'll be meat for the master's use. And he will be made ready and prepared unto every good work. God wants you to get prepared, ready and prepared unto the coming of the Lord, including to, for every good work in your life. That means we've got to cleanse ourselves. So we become a vessel of honor, sanctified, meet for the master's use. All unrighteousness, which is sin, has to be dealt with in your life. And you can overcome it all because you're dead to sin and you're alive unto God. Now we can yield ourselves to the walk in the Spirit according to the Word of God and conquer all areas of sin. 
So you'll be not only meet for the master's use, but prepared, ready and prepared into every good work to do all the things that God wants for you to do. Titus, chapter 3, verse 1. Put, in mind, put them in mind to be subject to principalities. This is talking about leaders. And powers, this means authorities, to obey magistrates, this is rulers. This is talking all about earthly rulers in government. Here you're to be subject to those ones that are leaders, those ones authorities, those ones in positions of authority, powers of rule of, rule of governments, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. People that think that you're not supposed to obey the law or obey the government, they're wrong. As long as it's not contrary to the Word of God, we've got a lot of people out there that are disobeying and they're making a big mistake because we are told that we are to be subject to authorities. We are to be subject to that which God has set. He has set people in positions of authority and we're to submit unto them. In fact, we even see over in 1 Peter Chapter 2, verse 13. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man. This would be everything that is a, an ordinance of the law of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king. And who's the king? King would be like a president or someone who is a king over a nation. As supreme or unto governors. Oh, that would include the governor of our state and the governor of states. As unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of them that do well. You know, we must understand that we are to be submissive unto the laws and unto those in positions of authority. Those people that do not think that they have to do that are in rebellion to God's word. It is wrong. It is sin on their part. Verse 17 Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king, which means you honor and revere the king. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and the gentle, but also to the froward. This refers to those that are crooked or wicked or unfair. You submit to it all. That's what God says. But well, this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endured grief and suffering wrongfully. You know, those people that despise governments, he talks about that. That's a mistake. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 10. Chiefly those that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise think little or nothing of government. <laughs> Presumptuous are they, self-willed, not afraid to speak evil of dignities. They're wrong. People do this all the time. It is wrong. We see in Jude, verse 8. Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, and despise. They want to set aside, disregard, and reject dominion. Dominion is government. That's what it's talking about. And speak evil of dignities. It's amazing. How Christians will not want to obey the law. And remember what Romans says. Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13 makes it real clear. Let every soul be subject unto the higher, these are uh, authorities, powers means ecstasy, authorities. There is no authority but of God. The authorities that ought be are ordained or have been set by God. That's what that means. Whosoever therefore resists the authority, resist the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves judgment. That's right. They're going to get judged. Rulers, talking about earthly rulers, are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the authority? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. He's the minister of God to thee for good, and if thou do that which is e evil, be afraid. 
that if he beareth not the sword in vain, for he's a minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. That's right. You break the law, you do wrong, then you're going to be punished. It's wrong. You must needs be subject, subject to authorities, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. Well, that's, another, that's important. And remember, that's also what we see in Titus chapter 3, where it says to be ready, prepared and ready to every good work. Why? Because you're submissive, you're obedient to authority. Those people that aren't obedient to authority, they aren't even qualified to minister whatsoever because they're in rebellion and they're in disobedience. A lot of people out there are rebellion and disobedience and don't do what is right. Another thing we see, <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. By faith Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen yet, as yet moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. He did what God told him to do. He had the fear of God. He was warned of God, what God told him to do. He condemned the world, became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith, because he did the things that God told him to do. That's what we need to do. We see over in 1 Peter, chapter 3, and verse 15. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. That's got to be your attitude with meekness, a gentle spirit, and the fear of the Lord. <clears throat> Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as the evildoers that they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation means manner of life, conduct, and behavior in Christ. For it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. If you suffer for well-doing, just don't be moved. You just do everything unto the Lord. You're to live everything unto the Lord. Do everything that you're supposed to be doing. That's what God's looking for. We also see in Revelation chapter 3. In Revelation chapter 3, here's where we have the Christian in name only. I know thy works, but thou hast a name that thou livest and are dead. Oh, you're not doing the word. Be watchful and strengthen the things that remain that are ready to die. Instead of being prepared and ready, <clears throat> things were dying out. Well, that sounds like the five foolish virgins who didn't, their, all their oil, their light was going out because they had not prepared themselves. They weren't doing what they were supposed to do. And he says, I don't even know you. He's ready to die. I've not found thy works fulfilled, this means, made full, not perfect, but made full, fulfilled, as Jones brings out, before God. That meant you haven't been doing the things that God said. You haven't been obedient. You haven't been working out your own salvation. You haven't been a doer of the word. You've been rebelling or doing things that are contrary to the word. Uh, you're not going to get anywhere. Remember thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I'll come on thee as a thief. That means suddenly. And thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. You won't know when all of a sudden it happens. And destructive things happen. That's why we got to be always prepared and ready. Walking in the ways of the Lord, we won't be surprised by anything. That's for sure. There was a few names even in Sardis that have not defiled their garments. They will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. No, you can't be defiled, have a defiled garment and think that you're worthy. No. Those ones that are walking in white, oh, they've cleansed themselves. They're righteous. They're going to have the linen garments, remember. They are worthy. And what else about them? He that overcometh, conquers and carries off the victory. The same will be clothed in white raiment. Ah, that is the clean white, righteous garments. He's put on the wedding garments, see? And I'll blo not blot out his name out of the book of life. What happens? Who gets blotted out? The defiled ones. God wants you to get prepared and get ready for walking in the ways of the Lord. You should be doing it every day of your life. <clears throat> but you're to be prepared and ready unto the coming of the Lord. Because you've got to re realize that <clears throat> 
there's going to be a judgment that is going to come. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 5. Look what it says. Who shall give account to him that's ready to judge the quick and the dead? He's going to judge everybody. Ready. He's ready to do it. Every one of us are going to give account. Every one of us are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We, we're going to give account. We're going to be judged. That's why we got to be prepared and ready by walking in the ways of the Lord. Give your heart unto Him. Prepare your heart. Turn away from all sin. Be humble before Him. Be a hearer and a doer of the Word. Make sure you're being obedient to the Word of God. You're doing what is right in His sight. You must live unto Him. This is all essential. Remember, He's coming suddenly to His temple. And He's going to find out who's right and who's not right. Because judgment will come to the church before it comes to the world. Therefore, we've got to make ourselves ready. And we'll go back to the verse we began with as we close this evening. Revelation 19, verse 7 and 8. Let us be glad and rejoice, give honor to Him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. His wife has made herself ready. You've got to make yourself ready. And you should make yourself ready and stay that way all the days of your life. To her was granted that she'd be arrayed in the fine linen, clean and white. The fine linen is the righteousness or the righteous acts of saints. God wants you to be prepared and ready unto the coming of the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for all that you brought forth. Thank you for your word that shows that we are to be prepared and ready to see you accomplish your work in our life, to be ready for anything that might come, to have our heart right, to be hearers and doers of the word, to be ready to obey, ready to give an answer, ready to overcome, be engaged in warfare, be prepared as in engaging in fighting the fight of faith and warring the good warfare and conquering all the enemies, be ready to deal with any temptations that come against us, all the things that we've discussed. Thank you, Father, for every single one of us understanding that we must become prepared and ready every day of our life unto the coming of the Lord. Thank you, Father, for each one being a hearer and a doer of your word and much fruit coming from this message in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God.